Well, uh, it's lovely to be here. My name's Serena and I'm from Grace Christian Fellowship. So um, I've got the word of the Lord for us today. And uh, I'm going to read from Psalm 84. So if you want to turn to it, you can. I'm going to read it out anyway. And uh, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, but it's fairly similar to the NIV, I think. Um, so Psalm 84. And the title of the sermon today is Joy in the Valley. And don't we need joy when we're in a valley? We definitely do. I'm just going to read from verse 1 to 7. Um, so Psalm 84, verse 1. And it starts off by saying, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body and soul, I will shout, shout joyfully to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow builds her nest and raises her young at a place near your altar, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. What joy for those who can live in your house, always singing your praises. Verse 5. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. When they walk through the valley of weeping, or some translations say Baca, it will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will clothe it with blessings. They will continue to grow stronger and each of them will appear before God in Jerusalem. Amen. What a lovely psalm, isn't it nice? You know, Charles Spurgeon said that Psalm 84 was uh, entitled to be called the pearl of psalms, the pearl of all the psalms. And he went on to say, if Psalm 23 is the most popular and Psalm 103 the most joyful, then this, Psalm 84, is one of the sweetest of the psalms of peace. Isn't that lovely? What joy and comfort we find throughout all the psalms. But, you know, I'm going to talk about a little section, a couple of verses from Psalm 84, and uh, mainly from sort of verse 5 to 7. And this section of the psalm is talking about the joy that is available to people whose hearts are fixed on the Lord. There is joy for us. Those who are dedicated, committed servants of the Lord. Do you know, it says that those people rely on the Lord for strength. Not necessarily on other things, and there are other things we rely on in life, but the, most, the, the thing that we must rely on mostly is the Lord and his strength. Amen. And it says that these people receive joy because they rely on the Lord uh, for his strength. And as you read through that psalm, it's rather lovely because it implies that these people are on a journey. They're, they're walking along a highway and they're on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to meet with God. That is their purpose. That's where they're going. Um, it implies that on this journey, they start off cheerful and happy. But after a while, they come to a dry, arid valley. And, um, but because their hearts are fixed on God, even the dry valley becomes a place of blessing. That's, that's sort of what the psalm is saying, isn't it? And uh, I think any one of us whose hearts are fixed on God, those of us who are dedicated and committed to the law, which I'm sure is everybody here, we can see ourselves as one of those pilgrims on this journey, can't we? Um, pilgrims who are on a journey to meet with the Lord throughout our life, generally. Those of us whose eyes and hearts are are solely for the purpose of meeting with the Lord and doing his purpose. We are the people on this, this pilgrimage. We are on a journey that ends with being in the presence of the Lord. And if you sort of start off reading, as we did, we find that, that these pilgrims start off their journey full of hope and full of joy. And wasn't it like that when you first got saved, or perhaps when you were younger and fitter and healthier and all the rest? You know, we start off full of joy, and God is great, and we can praise him, and everything's going right. 
It's a happy celebration as these people start their journey to meet with the Lord. But you know, in verse 6 in this psalm, it says that these pilgrims go through a deep, dark valley. The Valley of Baca. And um, Baca is translated as weeping. And I looked up a little bit about this valley and it says it was actually a valley near Jerusalem, so they think. Um, it was the last stage of the pilgrimage to, to Jerusalem. It was a gloomy, narrow valley. And uh, this little passage that I found, I think it was from a commentary, says, What causes the redeemed of the Lord to shed tears in this valley of weeping? Some weak because of intense physical pain and suffering that has become part of their daily experience. Still others are brought to tears over mental anguish of a situation that, through no fault of their own, has, be has come upon them. And it reminds, them to, reminds us to think about Job. You know, even as dedicated Christians, whose heart is right with the Lord, and we have a purpose of wanting to serve him, on our journey many times, we pass through a dark valley. A difficult time, a valley of weeping, a dry, barren, difficult place, a challenging place that we don't really want to be, to be in. Maybe even a place of tears and sorrow. We all can go through that. I'm sure we've all been there. We might even be there now. Uh, a time of suffering or worry or grief or pain, a valley of weeping. But you know what? This psalm is full of hope because it actually says that it's only by going through this valley that we then come to Zion. That's, that's the purpose of going through this valley, uh, that we actually come to the presence of God because we go through this valley. It's interesting because it's actually, it's part of the journey. Maybe these pilgrims knew when they started off from, you know, wherever they were going to. Perhaps they knew there was a valley ahead, but they still were prepared to go there because they think we want to meet with God. That is our purpose in life, to be closer to him. The only way to get there, to Zion, is to go through that valley. Do you know, I drove to um, Yarmouth the other day with a friend. Um, we're going to an art gallery because I, I make pottery. I make some um, ceramics and I put some of my uh, ceramics in a, a gallery in, in Yarmouth and they're selling it for me, which is rather nice. So I've sold a few pieces. So anyway, my friend and I, who's also an artist, um, we drove to Yarmouth. She was driving and she didn't quite know the way. So I said, well, we take this route and we're going to go along the Acle Strait. Anyone heard of the Acle Strait? I'm sure everybody's probably heard of the Acle Strait. Part of the A47, isn't it? And she said, oh, yeah, OK, all right, we'll go along the Acle Strait. Not been there before. Um, and I'm sure you know it's a long, straight, narrow, boring road that is very busy. And there seem to be sort of lorries that thunder along uh, back and forth on this road that's extremely narrow. Uh, it's single carriageway. There's no roads turning off of it. It's just a long, straight road. And there's nothing really to look at apart from sort of cars and horse, cows and horses, you know, on, on one side or the other. And it's almost like a stretch of marshland, isn't it? I actually looked it up in Wikipedia. I thought, I wonder if Wikipedia knows the Acle Strait because um, uh, it seems to be quite, quite well known around, around Norfolk. And it said the Acle Strait was built in 1831 over the Halvergate Marshes. I didn't know that. Uh, and it went on to say, the road is a notorious accident spot with numerous fatalities. As it, as it runs through the middle of uninhabited wetlands, there is no practical alternative route and detours can up to be up to 30 miles. It's a grim road, isn't it? But it's not a good one. Anyway, my friend and I were driving along it, and I'd sort of said, we'll go along the Acle Strait. And so she was driving along, and we kind of got halfway down it, and she said, this is a terrible road, isn't it? Absolutely awful. And um, do you know what? I think the Acle Strait is a bit like the Valley of Weeping. It's a bit like going through the Valley of Baca, isn't it? It's a horrible journey to go to. But you know what? If you want to get to Yarmouth from Norwich, you've kind of got to go along it, haven't you? 
And as we said, in the Valley of Weeping, you have to go through the Valley of Weeping to get to Zion. It's on the way. It's part of the journey. If you want to get to your destination, you've got to go that way. And as Wikipedia said there, there is no practical alternative route. You've got to go that way. Is it really? Yeah. Well, I didn't see anything spooky, but it was uh, lots of lorry drivers and big lorries. That's, that's the bit that I hate. You know, if you want to get to Yarmouth, you've got to go along it. Okay, amazing. Yeah, interesting. We had to go along it. I said to my friend, we've got to go along it, and, and we did have to, we did. The Valley of Weeping is part of our journey, just like the Acle Strait is if you want to get to Yarmouth. And before we see the presence of God in our lives, very often we have to go through a Valley of Weeping. We mentioned Joseph earlier, didn't we? He must have gone through a Valley of Weeping in that time in prison, but then he was brought out and, and uh, raised up. The valley of weeping is inevitable. It's part of the journey. So moving on, what happens in the valley? What happens in this valley of weeping? Verse 6 says, when they walk through the valley of weeping. When who? Who are we talking about? Well, as we mentioned earlier, we're talking about the people who have set their minds and hearts to go on the pilgrimage to meet with God. Dedicated Christians, followers of Jesus. Do you know, it's the route that Jesus took. Jesus went through a valley of weeping, didn't he? He probably went through several, I should think. You can see that meaning sort of perhaps his whole life here on earth. That we could have seen as a valley of weeping. Maybe his time in Gethsemane. We could say that that was a valley of weeping. Or maybe even that route he took, that I think is called the Via Dolorosa, isn't it? I don't know if I pronounced that right. The way of sorrow that he had to take on the way to his crucifixion. Jesus went through the valley of weeping. And you know what? If we follow the master, then we're going to have to go through one or two as well, aren't we? We are. That's what, that's what happens. If we are true disciples, true followers of the Lord, then we will follow him through the valley. Uh, a little passage quoted Psalm 84 said, Passing through the valley of weeping, they make it a place of string, springs. And so that's the, um, the, the uh, pil pilgrims. And it goes on to say, They, the pilgrims, as it were, pour their tears into the wells and they become sources of refreshment and fertility. So even when we're walking through this valley, it says they make it a place of springs. The pilgrims do. So through their tears, through their weeping, it becomes a place of refreshment, perhaps for other people walking through as well. Maybe other people's tears refresh other people, we don't know. You know, the Lord sees our tears in our times of grief. But if in our sorrow we're crying out to him, our tears will be rewarded with joy and refreshing. Amen? The Lord never leaves us in that valley. He always takes us through. Psalm 126 said, Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Amen? I was just talking to John in the little back room there, and I thought, John, you're preaching my sermon here. You must have known. But it's true, isn't it? Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. And we, we do. We may go through a valley, but we come out of it shouting God's praises. When these people, those who are sowing with tears, walk through the valley of weeping, it becomes a place of refreshing springs. And it goes on to say that it's not just springs of water from our tears, but there's something else that happens. It says that there will also be the autumn rains. So yes, it might seem like, Lord, it's me that's doing all the weeping. It's me that's doing all the crying. Is this the only refreshing I'm going to get? No, because when we do the weeping and the crying, he sends the autumn rains. Much more refreshing water, uh, the we could produce of our own selves. Amen? 
he sends the autumn rains. Blessing upon blessing in the valley of weeping. Spiritual rains refresh them, the pilgrims, even in this dark and gloomy valley. You know, I found a little story that I'm going to read out to you. It's quite a nice little story. And it starts off by saying, well, the title, in a sense, is Every true Christian must expect to find a well in each valley of Baca. And this is, this is the story, and it says, In every sorrow there is some relief. Sometimes trouble opens new rivers of joy in our experience. In one of the incidents in the Crimean War, a soldier lay dying of thirst. He was complaining bitterly that he was still left under fire as a cannonball tore past him. Meantime, this missile of iron buried itself in the cliffside behind him, splintered the rock, disclosed or uncovered a spring, and sent to his hot lips a full stream of water for his refreshment. Most of us have watched almost breathlessly as some tremendous providence or difficulty shattered our hope or health or comfort or our home. And yet, we found we were still alive afterwards, and indeed surrounded with blessings of which we never knew existed before, and never felt the power until now. Interesting, isn't it? There is always refreshing. God provides rains, springs in our valley. So the third point, what is the result of going through the valley and being refreshed with these springs and with the rain. Verse 7 says, these people who go through the valley will continue to grow stronger. Isn't that a wonderful blessing and a promise? These people who go through the valley will grow stronger. They don't get weaker, they don't sort of crawl out on their hands and knees, you know, gasping and, you know, sort of never be the same again. No, they come out stronger than they went in. I think that's amazing. It's only by going through a valley that we grow stronger as Christians. Amen. Amen. It's in the valley that we experience the provision and the blessing of God and the closeness of God. Because there's nothing like trouble to make us get on our knees or just cry out to the Lord for his help and his closeness, his comfort. Do you know what? It's in the valley that we grow strong. There is joy in the valley for those who patiently walk through this valley of weeping. It is part and parcel of every Christian walk. And there is always a valley before we come to the place of meeting with the presence of God. There's always a valley. There's another saying, isn't there? There is no mountain without its valley. You have, to have a, you have to have a valley if you want to have a mountain. And we want mountaintop experiences with the Lord, don't we? But unfortunately, there's a valley that goes with it. I was looking up in the commentary about this um, passage, and it said, As people travelled to Jerusalem to worship, they would pass through this weepy, uh, weary, weeping place, but their journey was worth it in the end. Those who experience sorrow in this life and who doesn't, can find strength in their faith in God. With the Lord held in his rightful place, we can find that the valley of weeping becomes a very different place. The journey of a faithful Christian through times of hardship is a step-by-step expedition from strength to strength. Hallelujah. And the fourth point, what happens in the end? Well, Finally, the pilgrims come to their destination, don't they? They come out of the valley and they appear before God. And you know what? That is the sole purpose of their journey. They didn't go at start on this journey with the intention of going through a valley. None of us do that. Our intention is to get closer to the Lord, to meet with him, to appear before God, to come into his presence. That is why they set out on this journey in the first place. That's why they willingly walk through the Valley of Tears. Spurgeon said, The object of each Israelite 
was not merely to be in the assembly, but to appear before God. Unless we realise the presence of God, we have done nothing. The mere gathering together is worth nothing. So their purpose was not just to have a big party, get to Jerusalem and celebrate. The purpose was to meet with the Lord. And that's what takes us through the valley, isn't it? Do you know what? We are never disappointed with our reward from God. The scripture says he is faithful who promised and we are rewarded with his presence. What greater reward is there than to stand before the Lord, to be closer to him, to hear his voice? There's nothing better than that, is there? Nikki and I, my friend, who the one who came over from India, we were students together at college and um, we shared a house at one point with one or two other people and we used to read the scriptures in the morning and we were listening to Christian tapes, you know, and teaching tapes and sometimes we'd have a great experience, we'd find something in the Bible that was so exciting um, that we'd sort of come out of our bedroom and we'd run up and down the landing going, oh, this is fantastic, this is so exciting. So now Nikki and I say when we find something exciting in the scriptures, it's a, it's a running up and down the landing moment and we both laugh because we both know what each other needs. Do you know what? We are never disappointed with the presence of God. And oh, won't heaven be wonderful? That's, that's the best thing about heaven, the presence of the Lord. Don't care about anything else, not really. Let's be where Jesus is. We are rewarded with his presence. You know, I was reminded of a poem that I found a long time ago. I'm sure you'll have heard of it. And it's called The Weaving Poem by, well, it's not by Corrie Ten Boom, but she quoted it, I think, in one of her books. Uh, I'm sure you know Corrie Ten Boom. She was a Dutch Christian, wasn't she, who survived the Nazi concentration camps. And she went on to preach all over the wor world. You can even hear her preach on, on the internet, can't you? There's some clips of her preaching. And she wrote famous books like The Hiding Place or Tramp for the Lord. Well, she quoted this poem in one of her books, The Weaving Poem. And it's a poem that I printed out for our church uh, years and years ago. And um, I printed them out and uh, gave everybody one. And, uh, you know, I still go around people's houses, occasionally see it stuck to the fridge. I think, oh, you've still got the poem, the weaving poem. Well, I'm just going to read this out because it is wonderful, just to, just to finish with. And so it starts off by saying, my life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colours he weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaves sorrow, and I, in foolish pride, forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skilful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares, nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. Isn't that wonderful? It's a fantastic poem. We only see the underside of the weaving, and you all know what the back of a bit of sewing looks like. My sewing, anyway, it's a complete mess. Nikki used to laugh at me because she always said, you sew back left to right or back to front instead of the, the other way. A tapestry, a weaving, is, is a bit of a mess on the back. And we only see that. That's our life, isn't it? It's like we're looking up at our life and you're, Lord, this is a complete mess. Look at that, look at that bit of thread. It's not going anywhere. That one's a complete mess. I made a mistake there, Lord. You know, we don't see it, but God unrolls the canvas and shows us the top side. And what a beautiful picture that is. Then we can see the picture that the Lord has been weaving. And we don't see it till he chooses to reveal it to us. Amen. We have to leave our times of suffering in his hand. He leads us through the valley and he brings us out again. And he brings us out strengthened, changed transformed, improved, and joyful. There is joy in the valley. So it's a wonderful psalm, isn't it? Let's be encouraged by it. When we walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. We have to go through the valley. The valley of tears is a place of joy and refreshing, 
and we are rewarded by being brought closer to the Lord, changed and transformed into his beautiful image. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. There we go. Is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. Shall I switch this off now or shall I? Yeah. Yeah. 